Hello, my name is Brandon Bibby, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund's digital series on cultural preservation. In this segment, you'll hear from architects, preservations, and historians on the challenges and opportunities of stewarding and interpreting black modernism and the cultural significance of black architects. We understand American modernism as a future forward movement of the 20th century, then we must also understand that for most of that time, the realities of America still existed in black and white as African Americans blossomed out of the shadows of Jim Crow. Modernity brought explorations of Afrofuturism, the Harlem Renaissance, the life of the Negro, new Negro, paired with resistance against integration and the impacts of urban renewal on black cultural institutions and communities that were forced to adapt, build, and rebuild their spaces. My name is Brandon Bibby, Senior Preservation Architect for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, and I'm honored to uh, introduce our next panel on architecture and identity, highlighting the work and scholarship around conserving black modernism. In 2022, the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and the Getty Foundation's Keeping It Modern Initiative launched Conserving Black Modernism, a $3.1 million two-year grant program focused on identifying and preserving sites of modernism designed by African Americans. In June of 2023, we announced the first eight sites awarded, which include the Charles McAfee Swimming Pool and Pool House in Wichita, designed by Charles McAfee, who's here with us today. Um, <laughs> the What's Happening Cultural Center in Los Angeles, designed by Robert Kennard and Arthur Silvers. The Carson City Hall Building in California, also designed by Robert Kennard. The First Baptist Church West in Charlotte, designed by Harvey Gant. Fourth Baptist Church Educational Wing in Richmond, designed by Ethel Bailey Furman. Jenkins Hall at Morgan State University, designed by Louis Edwin Fry. Second Baptist Church of Detroit's Education Building, designed by Nathan Johnson. And Zion Baptist Church in Philadelphia, designed by Walter, Leving Walter Levingston Jr. Each site was awarded $150,000 for comprehensive preservation planning along with technical assistance and advisory through the planning process and opportunities to strengthen capacity and stewardship through education, educational convenings and workshops hosted by Getty and the Action Fund. Conserving Black Modernism is more than a grant program. It's about intentionally opening the dialogue on the influence of the Black experience in American modernism and design. It is about public participation in the research and exploration that informs how we talk about modern black space in this country. It is with great honor that I introduce our moderator for today's panel, curator and scholar, Dr. Michelle Joan Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson is the curator of architecture and design at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Her most recent efforts explore issues of race and representation in architectural rendering. She is co-curator of the forthcoming Making Home Smithsonian Design Triennial at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in 2024. Dr. Wilkinson co-curated the, the exhibitions A Century in the Making, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and Changing America, 1968 and Beyond. In 2018, she served as the lead organi organizer for the National Museum's three-day symposium, Shifting the Landscape, Black Architects and Planners, 1968 to now. Prior to her current appointment, Dr. Wilkinson spent six years as Director of Collections and Exhibitions at Maryland's Reginald F. Lewis Museum. She has also worked at the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian Art Museum, uh, Smithsonian Art Museum, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. As a fellow of the Center for Curatorial Leadership in 2012, she completed a residency at the Design Museum in London, and she was a 2019 Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Joan Wilkinson, Michelle Joan Wilkinson. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can see me beyond the podium. <laughs> Um, I have the pleasure of moderating this panel on architecture and identity. 
and I'm delighted to be here um, and joined by our esteemed panelists as well as um, this wonderful crowd. So our panel is going to be looking at the challenges and opportunities for stewarding and interpreting black modernism and the cultural significance of black American architects in general. So I'll begin by introducing um, our panelists and then giving kind of some overview framing remarks. Our first panelist, Gail Kennard, is president of Kennard Design Group, KDG Architecture and Planning, a Los Angeles-based architecture firm founded in 1957 by Kennard's father, the late Robert Kennard, FAIA. KDG is one of the oldest African-American-owned architectural practices in the Western United States. Nikita Reed is an associate at Quinn Evans. She is an award-winning architect with experience in rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of historic buildings, with a focus on sustainable strategies in design and construction. Reed is a registered architect, a lead accredited professional, and a certified passive house consultant. Charles L. Davis II is an associate professor of architectural history and criticism at UT Austin School of Architecture. His academic research excavates the role of racial identity and race thinking in architectural history and contemporary design culture. He is the author of Building Character, The Racial Politics of Modern Architectural Style. Dale Glenwood Green is professor for the practice of architecture and historic preservation at Morgan State University. Professor Green is also a partner in the fifth oldest African-American architectural firm in the nation, Sultan Campbell Britt and Associates PC, where he works to develop new sites and preserve historical ones. Please join me in welcoming the panel. So for my opening remarks, I just, I'm gonna make some remarks from the um, podium and then I'll move and sit and join the panelists. To get us started, I want us to think about those terms that have brought us together today, cultural, preservation, and leadership. These words are part of the work we all do in some capacity. In my role as Curator of Architecture and Design at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I contribute to the long-term preservation of archives and other materials related to black architects. In doing so, our collections document and capture aspects of black history and black cultural expression that emanate from architectural practice. For me, also, the leadership work comes not only from establishing a new curatorial area for architecture and design at the museum, but in developing programming like our symposium that was just mentioned, Shifting the Landscape, Black Architects and Planners, 1968 to now. It was a gathering of over 500 which recognized pivotal contributions to the field over the past 50 years. So understanding that the work and experiences of black architects, to understand that within the context of American history, shows us not only what black architects were able to accomplish, but also often what the roadblocks have been and the spaces in which they, black architects, were or were not able to thrive. So for example, historically black colleges and university campuses and black churches emerge as two key sites for black architects' commissions. When racial discrimination and segregation restricted I'm sorry, when racial discrimination and segregation restricted access to predominantly white schools of architecture and limited black architects equal access to building contracts, there were black communities that invited and supported these professionals. Thus, I think about the kind of design expression that comes out of these culturally informed frameworks, a point that we can delve into today. So in discussing architecture and identity, there is a lot to explore. I'm gonna to move to the Podium, move away from the podium and begin our discussion. Welcome. Yeah. So the first question I'd like to, I think, am I okay? Beautiful. Uh, the first question I'd like to begin with is really about um, our identities. And so I think one of our identities as preservationists and practitioners is being a steward what does stewardship of black architectural legacies mean to you? And why must we protect and preserve the work of black architects, its documentation and interpretation? And Gail, why don't we start with you? Okay. Thank you, Michelle. And I represent, I'm a steward. And I have to acknowledge my ancestors and thank them for surviving enslavement and oppression and making my life possible here today. I also am from California, 
and I live in the ancestral and unceded homeland of the Tongva, Quiche, and Gabrielino nation. Their descendants have also survived, and I acknowledge them, I acknowledge the people, and I acknowledge the land. So thank you for indulging me in that. Yeah. So the question is legacy and stewardship. And, and stewardship. So um, my father was born in Los Angeles in 1920. Uh, he passed away in 1995. And he stood on the shoulders of another amazing black architect, Paul R. Williams. And it, had it not been for the example of Paul R. Williams, my father's career would not have, have taken place. He could not have had the career that he had. So carrying on is a really important, um, an important value that I think we need to, to emulate. So each generation takes it another step. So the legacy piece is really important. So I think we all need to model that in whatever we are all doing individually. Um, when my father died, I decided it was really important to continue the legacy of his firm. So we are now still continuing as an architectural design firm owned by African Americans in the city of Los Angeles. So um, there's a lot of complications to that, but uh, I'll, I'll just leave that it, with that, that it, the, uh, the stewardship is a really important component. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I think stewardship can be thought of as a kind of multiple layered process and there are lots of ways to steward sites and um, uh, personal histories etc so I, I want to focus on the necessity for us to be writing our own history mm. and not leaving it to others to write for us because they will look at our cultural productions through their own lenses and then uh, when we enter the professions of architecture and historic preservation and planning with their languages, we are now robbed of the terms that we need to understand our cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. So um, as a historian, I think it's important to not only acknowledge that, like to, to not just say modern architecture in a general sense, but to be specific. We want to talk about black architectural modernity. We want to identify what is black about it. If we want to talk about European or Euro-American architectural modernity, identify what is hegemonic about that and how is it different and distinct from the cultural projects that black people needed to do in order to live in this space. Um, and if we do that, then I think we, we're really challenging um, a kind of assumed authority of who the architect is, who the author is, uh, and we need to pluralize that in a way that allows for us to tell our full story. So I, I feel like we've been robbed of the vocabulary we need to tell our stories, and we need to encourage our community to tell more of those stories so that we have the vocabulary needed to understand what is black modernism, what is, how do we understand the, the meaning of these, these spaces and fabrics. And if we do that, then I think, you know, as always, the, the larger discipline and profession benefits because we give them the vocabulary by which to understand this broader plurality. But at least we have a firmer base of understanding what legacies we inherit yeah. and what we need to do to keep them going in the future. Yeah. And I definitely want to make sure we, we delve into that term modernism, so we're going to come back to that as well. Um, to think about stewardship a little bit more, maybe Dale and Akita, do you have anything you would like to share about that? Yeah, and so I think one of the things that um, stewardship also layers into is the fact that there really are not that many black architects. In, this, in the grand scheme of things, of the 100,000 licensed architects that there are in the country, about 2% are African American. And of that 100,000, there are about 560 black licensed women who are architects. So to put that in context, we've sent more people to space than there are licensed black women architects in the country which blows my mind that we were sending that many people to space. But anyways, um, <laughs> um, but I think the idea of us telling our story, <laughs> the way that Charles is mentioning, and us being able to feel comfortable telling our story instead of waiting for someone else to tell our story for us, 
realizing that we have validity to tell our stories and we don't have to be validated by others telling our stories for us. And being able to continue that stewardship and that language is something that's really important. Yeah, <clears throat> I wanna echo on that. In fact, um, I think it's very important from a legacy and stewardship stance that uh, the seven historically black colleges and universities that have architecture schools of the 125 schools of architecture that exist understand a real obligation that we have uh, to steward the African-American architect legacy. Um, I'm very fortunate as a professor of one such historically black college and university at Morgan State University in Baltimore to have had the opportunity to start a black architect seminar course in 2010 and have consecutively taught that course since 2010. And so much of what Nikita has mentioned is so important for us not only to educate our students, but there were faculty members who did not understand the legacy of African American architects. There's the greater public who is unaware of the legacy of African American architects. And so when I look at that from a legacy standpoint, I look at it borrowing from Dr. Booker T. Washington really to lift the veil of anonymity over a legacy of nameless, faceless individuals such as some of the nation's premier African-American architects, some of which have been acknowledged um, on the stage. But I would go further to say we also have to understand that only 7% of African-American students represent all architecture students. NAB says there's less than 60 black architecture professors in the country. And then we look at legacy architectural firms that are African American. There are a lot of disparities in the profession of architecture, but there are a lot of contributions that African Americans have made in that regards as well that have been lost without us, like, without us stewarding this rich legacy. Uh, what you said is just so important in terms of the statistics you just mentioned. It's interesting that there's a higher statistic of African American or black students in architecture schools than there is percentage wise of practicing black architects, licensed practicing black architects. So that also tells us something about that experience, the trajectory through academia. And I think stewardship in the work that you're doing as a professor and you as well, Charles, um, that is part of it, right? You know, we don't get to the research and documentation without people coming on the outside of that. And so whether um, all of those students end up practicing architecture, the fact that they have a chance to study it and understand that history is really important. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, preservation, right? You're all involved in preservation in some way. And there's, um, there's a physical aspect of preservation. We had a wonderful conversation earlier about kind of social equity and cultural um, equity. And then there's this kind of physical aspect and there's a lot of rigid, rigidness around um, how things get preserved. Um, so when we talk about physical characteristics, the aesthetics and construction, including of modernist structures, what challenges and opportunities are there in preserving these spaces, and how does your work intersect with that? I'll jump in on this one. Uh, so particularly when it comes to modernism, um, that a lot of modernist buildings are characterized by concrete and glass. Um, materials that have high embodied carbon content, materials that aren't often easy to recycle. Uh, and so when thinking about preservation, when thinking about the physical aspects of it, um, we have to think about how building reuse is climate action. And we have to think about the way that we can uh, expand the narrative of preservation to really talk about the sustainability aspects of it. And so there's one hand where there's the concrete and glass structures, but then there's the other hand where there were some buildings that were built with materials that were under-resourced, um, as the previous panel mentioned. Uh, and so a lot of times preservation is based on um, architectural integrity and really looking at the high style, beautiful architecture. But we have to expand that to realize that there are some buildings that were purposely disinvested, that didn't have the resources to go there, and they need to be able to still, that story needs to be told. Um, and so being thoughtful and creative and figuring out ways to reuse the buildings um, in a way that's also going to make them more sustainable um, and perform better is something that my work circles around. Uh, particularly when we realize that about two-thirds of the existing building stock that exists today will still be here in 2050. And so really talk, thinking and talking about how all of uh, reusing all these buildings can really help with our climate action initiatives uh, and improve operational buildings is something that um, our work focuses on a lot. Yes. Okay. So I also serve on the City of Los Angeles Cultural Heritage Commission. And this, of course, is a huge issue on cultural integrity, uh, uh, architectural integrity, structural integrity, the physical side. 
and then there's the cultural side. So one of the things that's really encouraging to me now is the, the use of AR, augmented reality, and those kinds of tools that can help tell stories where the physical building doesn't. Because remember, we're looking at a framework where it's all kind of the architectural significance, it's the master, I hate that word master, but master architect issue um, that you know, oh, this is a significant building because it was designed by X, Y, and Z. And a, a, a person who doesn't understand the history would drive by a building like that and say, oh, yes, it's stunning, it's wonderful. You drive by a building that's more humble, a place like, for example, in Los Angeles, we have um, the Monday Women's Club, which was a, the first African-American women's club building built at the turn of the century. And these women scraped together their money purchased his property in 1926. But if you look at that property today, it was almost gonna be demolished. So the physical building doesn't tell the story. So that's why we've got to repurpose buildings and use these other tools that we now have in technology to, to tell the broader story. Because if we don't tell these stories, they're lost. Yeah. Charles or um, Dale, would you like to pick up on that a little bit in terms of preservation and your own work? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll use the featured slide that's there, of course, from Oregon State University and the Jenkins Building that you see and acknowledge that um, the university was one of the inaugural recipients for the uh, Modern Conservation Grant. And certainly we've had a long-term partnership with the National Trust um, for Historic Preservation through Brent Legs, uh, who originally worked with the institution to uh, secure the designation for the national treasure. So our entire campus uh, was designated a national treasure. Some of the challenges uh, with that that has led to uh, the Jenkins uh, building that you see here is that in order for campuses in particular and uh, historically black colleges and university campuses to remain competitive uh, with a number of other uh, non-HBCU campuses, oftentimes our historic and or existing buildings are threatened as a result. Um, a lot of the new construction and the fancier, if you will, steel and glass buildings um, tend to be more attractive to the parents and to the greater public and to the students. And so when you look at the building that you see here, there are a couple of things that challenge uh, sort of the university, if you will. One topic we've not talked about yet is sort of uh, the fact that um, this particular style or brutalist style building is also one that is widely uh, least understood. Uh, we've talked about the unawareness, if you will, of African American architects, uh, but also this is a style that's least appreciated, uh, it's least understood, and you couple that with the fact that um, a greater campus is looking to have newer buildings, you can see how the building would remain vacant if not be slated for demolition. Um, and so in this particular case, uh, we were able to, with the National Trust support, really elevate the state's awareness of the significance of this building. It was designed by Louis Edwin Fry, uh, who was one of the nation's most premier architects who happened to be African American. Um, he was the third arch black architect to be elected to the College of Fellows. Uh, was a founder of the National Organization of Minority Architects, studied under Albert Cassell and Hilliard Robinson, led a, a firm uh, with uh, John Fry, who was a former dean at Tuskegee, um, and his son and his grandson also became architects. But in regards to this particular style, he was the uh, first African-American student to graduate with a Master's of Architecture at Harvard University, where his thesis was brutalism where he studied under Walter Gropius, who was one of the five prominent architects of the brutalist style. And so embedded in this building and in its architecture is all of that culture, significant to the African-American experience, significant to uh, modernism and the brutalist style. Uh, and we're leveraging all of that now uh, to develop a plan with the support of the funding where the history, the mission, and the legacy will coalesce with the proposed use for this building. So we're very eager uh, to get this project now started with the support of the National Trust. I just got a clap on that. <laughs> Thank you for breaking that down. I saw Charles, you're scratching your, uh, no, please no, jump no. in. Uh, there's a lot of good points there. Um, I'll just I'll mention one project that we're 
um, undertaking at UT Austin in response to uh, an excellent point made earlier that um, buildings don't always tell the stories on their faces. Um, and that, that's a very, it's actually a very Eurocentric way of looking at a building, <laughs> expecting the building to tell us everything through its style, through its form. Um, and so um, one of the things that we're doing at UT Austin is we're establishing something called the Black Space Archive, which looks at the ways that um, modernist spaces and buildings actually have their meanings changed by the activities that take place within them. And that the, the notion of who authors a building is much broader than just the architect or the designer. And acknowledging this, um, looking at uh, everything from radical homemakers to um, artists who operate at the scale of a building, uh, we get a sense then of, uh, through the use of oral histories, hab style documentations, and LIDAR scans, existing scans where we can do walkthroughs of buildings. We get a sense of the embodiment of place that happens. And we're able to restore with names some of the vernacular designers who used the building, transformed it, as opposed to just the name of the architect or the, the person at the top of that intellectual pyramid. And, and for us, it's a way of pluralizing both how professional architects understand black material culture as well as design pedagogy in, in architectural schools, getting people to realize that the people who make these spaces are not just the people who pay for the building or who design the building, but it's a broader practice, especially within what I think of as black modernism as a cultural project. It's a shared project. It's not one of you know, genius authors and, and single uh, players. And so in that sense, we're just trying to provide people with the vocabulary to be able to talk about this in a way that's a bit more legible and where we can trace the longer histories of these projects. Yeah, I think that's key what you just shared about all the hands and minds that go into the, um, the space, the building, the creation, the use. And I think we will talk a little bit more about that as well because I think that's, that's what we're here for, you know, in terms of preservation. It's not just the site or the cultural landscape, it's the, the whole um, ecosystem of its use and particularly in black communities, the way spaces get activated and animated through use. Um, to go back to modernism, I'd like us to go a little bit deeper there. So, you know, this panel is sort of in conjunction with the Conserving Black Modernism grant program. And I wanted to talk through this word about modernism explicitly, understanding mo modernism versus black modernism. Why is there a need to define black modernism as a term and or style of architecture and design? Why speak of a black modernism and not just say this is modernism designed by black architects? Is there a distinction and if so, why is it important? And Charles, I'll start with you, but I'll ask everyone else to, to jump in and uh, weigh in as well. So, so I want you all to know that um, me thinking about answering this question has haunted my dreams as <laughs> I'm speaking to you here, right? Because um, uh, for me, um, modernism, as it is understood in architectural history, is a cultural project. And within the context of the United States, which is a settler colony, it is a racialized <laughs> cultural project. So to refer to buildings designed by a minority group, a marginalized social group, as belonging to this hegemonic category is just definitionally incorrect. So it's better to identify modernism as we understand it as European modernism or Euro-American modernism so that we can identify the differences that other cultural groups have had to make and the changes that they have had to make to make modernism theirs. So when I talk about black modernism and black modern architecture, I'm speaking of it in the sense that Paul Gilroy talked about the black Atlantic, mm -hmm. where we tend to reference intellectually the legacy from Western Europe to the United States, but we forget about the transatlantic slave trade in Africa and the trades that come that way. So understanding the black Atlantic understands a synthetic integration of Western means and practices with black cultural needs and, and practices and spaces. And so black architectural modernism has to be that broader cultural project. And so of course we use the same materials and we use the same drawing conventions and notations, et cetera, but there's an embodied sense of place 
in a lot of black modern architectural spaces that we have yet to write. Mm. And it's the embodiment, the spatial embodiment, that I think we miss in architecture, particularly in architectural schools. And so it's really interesting to talk about architecture within the context of preservation, because preservationists tend to understand this and foreground this, this idea of placemaking, long histories of buildings, uh, looking at the, the social settings themselves. Architects, you know, I don't want to beat up on them too much, but they inherit a practice where they need to be the genius maker. And there's a lot of pressure to say what is it that I have innovated in this space. So it's always future forward and individually oriented. And it usually reproduces the, the systems of power and inequality that we have. So it, architecture labors under this practice of um, being recognized as a cultural producer through what I would call cultural appropriation, taking the work of other vernacular makers and transforming it into something that you can take credit for. Mm. So if we, if we want to change the way that we understand this, I think having a preservationist lens is useful because it deconstructs this top-down hierarchical sense of authorship and forces us to acknowledge the broader sense of mission that happens. And particularly within black communities, responding to black social movements, responding to the need to humanize communities in an anti-black space. Um, these spaces mean more. And so I've, I've resisted this tendency to look at black modernism through a formalist lens. Okay. And I now bring a kind of phenomenological or embodiment lens to it. I think that's a, that's a beginning of a corrective. <laughs> but we got a lot of history to write. I mean, we have a lot of history to kind of undo those those static principles, and I think that um, uh, that's, for me, what I think uh, is the work that this is starting to do, this, this kind of project is starting to do. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we, we are running short on time, and so one of the things I'd ask the panelists to do is to kind of have a call to action, thinking back to 68 when Whitney M. Young, who was then the head of the National Urban League, issued his call to action to architects, the architectural field, to do something to address critical needs in the profession or in society through their skills and their professionalism. And so in the minute that we do have, I'd like to ask each of you, I feel like you just shared a, a call to action as a new way of thinking about this, but if um, Dale or Nikita or Gail would like to share what um, what you think needs to be done and what a call to action might be for you. Sure, um, my call to action is to do, to tell these stories. So the person who wrote the book about Paul R. Williams was his granddaughter. The only the family members have been doing that. I'm fortunately, I have a contract now with a publisher to write a biography of my own father, which is wonderful, but I'm a family member. I encourage all of you in your communities to reach out, identify these black architects, especially the women architects, um, and document their stories. The students need to be given assignments. Mm -hmm. One of the students at University of Southern California did his dissertation on my father, thank God. So at least it validates that this is a story, in, it's, it's a valid story, right? So if my any, in, many call to action would be tell these stories. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my call to action would be to expand the narrative to realize that building reuse is climate action. Mm. I, I'm always surprised when people are like, well, what do existing buildings have to do with sustainability? Excuse me? Um, <laughs> everything. Uh, and so just realizing that the operation of our buildings, the construction of our buildings, really uh, admit about 40 to 45% of the greenhouse gases um, in the atmosphere. Like, buildings have a substantial environmental impact. Uh, and so being able to expand that narrative and realizing that there is a story and connection to climate action is something that I think also opens up a number of funding resources for historic buildings and gets more people interested in preserving a historic place as opposed to just thinking of just the cultural aspects that happen there. Yeah, my call to action will be uh, somewhat similar to one that I gave in, um, I guess, the earlier part of this year. I see Tuskegee here in Florida AMU and Howard. Um, and we had a convening of the seven HBCUs of architecture, which Brent Legs and the National Trust participated in. And I think it's important for us as we sit here talking about architecture and preservation 
uh, to recognize that, again, of the 125 schools of architecture, not, not just the seven HBCUs that I referenced, we still have a great disparity in terms of the infusion of preservation within the context of architecture. You can still be trained as an architect and not work on an existing or historic building. And there's a problem with that. And as educators, we have to truly embed within the context of our studios existing and historic buildings. Students can graduate in six years and, all, and, and have only designed new buildings. Never have an existing or historic building as part of an adaptive reuse studio across these 125 schools. And so in order for us to really cultivate um, a, a, a generation of preservationists and preservation architects, and in particular, uh, responding to a Whitney M. Young's call to diversify the profession, because we've talked about architecture, but in preservation, the stats are 50 years old, white, and male. That's the majority of the preservation industry. And so in order to get minority students, female students, et cetera, more involved and engaged in the discipline of preservation coupled with architecture, we certainly have to put a, a serious earnest call out about how we're going to uh, dismantle some of the architectural education practices that have really excluded preservation from being more formally a part of it, the education. Thank you, thank you. So I mean, thank you the panel. Hello, I'm Felicia Lashad, and I serve as co-chair for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Thank you for joining us for this year-long digital series, which highlights the cultural preservation movement that's happening all over our nation in the name of saving historic African American spaces. We're glad you're here. And we hope you're encouraged to support the preservation of historic African-American buildings and spaces.